Imagine waking up one morning and realizing that you have an additional $145,000 in your bank account. This will soon happen to 23,000 people around the world. Mountain Gox was one of the earliest Bitcoin exchanges, and as of 2014, it handled 70% of all Bitcoin transactions in the world. Despite how prominent it once was, there's a good chance you've never even heard of it as it hasn't been operating for the last 8 years. The exchange was hacked and they lost 750,000 Bitcoin, worth about $375 million at the time. This was almost all the Bitcoin that customers held on the platform, and 7% of all Bitcoin in circulation. They halted withdrawals and declared bankruptcy, with some customers losing everything. Given how large Mountain Gox was in the industry, many feared that this would spell the end for Bitcoin. Soon after the hack, they were able to recover some of the lost Bitcoins. And now, 8 years later, the defunct crypto exchange is on the verge of returning the remaining 140,000 Bitcoins that they still possess to depositors. There are only enough coins left for each depositor to get 0.23 bitcoins for each one they originally owned. But during this time, the price of bitcoin has increased 40-fold, so they are set to receive a 9 times gain on investment, or $145,000 each on average. But this pales in comparison to the $15 billion the stolen bitcoins will be worth today. In this video, we'll look at how Mountain Gox was hacked, and why it took 8 years for customers to get any of their money back. This video is brought to you by Masterworks. I found this heat map and thought it was very interesting. Apple, red. Amazon, red. And needless to say, crypto is even worse. But look over there at that green. While everyone else is down 20, 30, 40%, our auction sales are up 32% for the year. In fact, the New York Times recently called fine art bulletproof. But art isn't just about stability. Art has outpaced the S&P more than two times from 1995 to 2021. More importantly, contemporary art has outpaced both gold and the S&P when inflation is above 3% due to its increased demand as a hedge. Unfortunately, up until recently most investors didn't have a crucial piece of the puzzle, a way to invest in art. But that's all changed thanks to a unicorn startup called Masterworks. They're securitizing paintings with the SEC so their 450,000 plus members can add art into their portfolios through fractional investing. And the track record speaks for itself. So far, each of the four paintings that they've sold, after offering them on the platform, have each delivered over 25% net returns to their investors. So if you want to join hundreds of Wall Street Millennial subscribers and myself already on Masterworks, you can skip the waitlist by clicking the link in the description below for VIP access. And now back to the video. Mountain Gox was created by a man named Jed McCaleb in 2007, a full two years before Bitcoin was created. He originally created it as an online exchange for people to buy and sell Magic the Gathering cards. He chose the name Magic the Gathering Online Exchange, which he shortened to Mountain Gox. In 2010, he learned about the recently created Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system, which he heard about through online forums. At the time, there were no centralized Bitcoin exchanges. All transactions were done over the counter. If you had a Bitcoin that you wanted to sell, you'd have to go across online forums and find someone who wanted to buy. You would then negotiate on a price and transfer them your Bitcoin. There are a couple major problems with this. Firstly, if you send your Bitcoin to someone you meet online, there is no guarantee that they'll transfer you the cash in return as agreed. Secondly, each transaction was individually negotiated, and prices could vary widely. At any given time, there is no definitive source to tell you how much your Bitcoin should be worth. In 2011, McCaleb sold Mountain Gox to a French businessman by the name of Marc Carpeles who was living in Japan. Almost immediately after Carpeles took over, the problems began. In the summer of 2011, there was a flash crash on the Mountain Gox platform, whereby the price of Bitcoin fell from $16 down to $0.01 cent within a matter of minutes. As it turns out, a hacker got access to a Mountain Gox employee's computer and put in fake ask orders to crash the price down to $0.01. Cent. This let him fraudulently acquire 25,000 Bitcoins. The perpetrator was never caught. The hack in 2011 only stole a small percentage of Bitcoin that was held on the exchange. But this gap had to be made up somehow. The amount of Bitcoins that they held was less than what depositors thought they had and could potentially call to withdraw at any time. Similar to a bank, Mt. Gox functioned under a fractional reserve system. Depositors put Bitcoins onto the platform and in their accounts it says they own X number of coins. But Mt. Gox only has to deliver those coins when the customer withdraws. As long as Bitcoin is increasing in popularity, there will be more people coming in than leaving, so there will be net inflows to Mt. Gox. Even if they were insolvent, they would never default on customer obligations so long as net inflows are positive. To keep inflows positive, they needed people to have confidence in the exchange and confidence in Bitcoin itself. 
To maintain this confidence, they wanted trading volume to be high and the price of Bitcoin to continually increase. So Mark Kerpeles created the so-called Willy Bot and possibly also the Marcus Bot. These bots were computer programs that would manipulate the price of Bitcoin on the exchange. They were programmed to continuously buy huge numbers of Bitcoin from Mt. Gox customers. While they were active, they would sometimes buy more than one Bitcoin per minute. According to an academic paper published by Gandal, Hamrick, Moore, and Oberman, these bots were at least partially responsible for the price of Bitcoin pumping to a high of $1,000 in 2013. On the surface, this sounded great. Mt. Gox was buying Bitcoin from its customers at very high prices. But where was all this money coming from? It wasn't coming from anywhere. There was no money. It was an elaborate shell game that Kerpelez allegedly devised to hide the deteriorating financial condition of Mt. Gox. The exchange implemented restrictive withdrawal limits for both Bitcoin and fiat currency holdings. This was ostensibly to comply with anti-money laundering regulations, but it may also have reduced outflows and kept the house of cards standing. Under the surface, the company's Bitcoin holdings were rapidly disappearing as they had been compromised by yet another hack, far bigger than the one from 2011, and to date, the largest Bitcoin heist ever undertaken. In February of 2014, they halted all Bitcoin withdrawals from the platform. Soon thereafter, an internal presentation was leaked, saying that they had lost 750,000 Bitcoins due to a malleability-related theft which had gone unprotected for years. This represented about 7% of all outstanding Bitcoin at the time, and today is the largest single Bitcoin heist by far. So what is a malleability-related theft? This is related to the concept of double spending. Let's say I own one Bitcoin. If I could sell this single Bitcoin to two different people, I could theoretically mint an unlimited number of Bitcoins. To prevent this, each transaction is recorded on a public ledger. The first transaction I send will be approved because the miners will confirm that I indeed own the Bitcoin that I am trying to transfer. By approving this transaction, they update the public ledger to show that I no longer possess this coin. If I try to send that Bitcoin again, it will be rejected by the miners because they see that I no longer own this coin. Mt. Gox originally claimed that there was some bug in the Bitcoin protocol, which a hacker exploited to erase the transactions and make it look like they never happened. Thus, the transaction would be sent again, thus draining Mt. Gox's reserves. They were basically saying don't blame us, blame Satoshi Nakamoto. If there was truly a flaw with the Bitcoin protocol itself, this would be a fundamental problem and likely spell a collapse in trust for all cryptocurrencies. As it turns out, it was a malleability issue. But the issue wasn't with the Bitcoin protocol itself. It was instead with Mt. Gox's internal system. The perpetrator somehow gained access to Mt. Gox's internal auditing computers. Every time someone buys a Bitcoin on Mt. Gox, the auditing computer checks the transaction ID on the public ledger. The hacker would buy Bitcoin and then edit the transaction ID on the auditing computer. The auditing computer would not see the fake transaction ID on the public ledger and would assume the transaction failed. To correct this, they would send the hacker the Bitcoin a second time. The hack did this over and over and over again. This way, the hacker drained all of the Bitcoin from Mt. Gox's hot wallet. But luckily, the vast majority of customer Bitcoin was held in cold storage and could only be accessed with the private keys. So it should have been safe, right? Apparently, Mark Kerpeles and other Mt. Gox employees were extremely incompetent and almost never audited how many coins were in their cold storage. As the hacker drained the hot wallet, Mt. Gox staff would withdraw money from cold storage to fill it back up. Sometimes, they would also deposit more coins into cold storage when the hot wallet filled up as regular customers sold their Bitcoin. The rate of withdrawals from cold storage was slightly higher than the rate of deposits, but the hacker did this slowly over many months or even years so they never noticed this and they never properly audited it. By 2014, the cold storage was completely emptied out. According to the crypto security firm WizSEC, Mt. Gox had a significant deficit since the initial small hack in 2011. Over the next three years, the deficit increased as the hacker extracted more coins. Whether Mark Kerpeles knew it or not, the exchange was insolvent for more than two years before it finally imploded in 2014. In the end, all they had left was 200,000 bitcoins, while their customers had claims on 950,000. Ironically, the reason that they had 200,000 bitcoins remaining after the hack was more incompetence on the part of Mt. Gox. The remaining coins were in an old wallet the company had forgotten about. It was not connected to the system that refilled the hot wallet, and thus were not taken by the hacker. The coins that were stolen were worth $375 million at the time, but would be worth about $15 billion today. The coins were laundered through many wallets and exchanges. One of said exchanges was the Russian-based BTCE. 
BTCE was one of the most popular crypto exchanges among international criminal organizations who wanted to launder their ill-gotten funds. They were shut down by US authorities for violating anti-money laundering regulations. BTCE was led by the Russian citizen Alexander Vinnik. In 2017, he was arrested in Greece, extradited to France, and then again extradited to the US where he currently awaits trial. It looks like he was involved in laundering at least some of the bitcoins stolen from Mt. Gox. It is likely that whoever stole the coins used Vinix company BTCE to launder the coins. The identity of the mastermind is still unknown, and to date, the coins have not been recovered. In 2014, Mt. Gox customers were furious as three quarters of their Bitcoin disappeared. Mt. Gox declared bankruptcy, and the remaining 200,000 coins were locked up in the coffers of a bankruptcy administrator. While Mt. Gox was founded in the US and owned by a French national, it was based in Japan, which has notoriously slow bankruptcy courts. There's no evidence the CEO Mark Kerpola stole the Bitcoin, but he was charged with manipulating company data to make it appear that they had more cash in Bitcoin than was the reality. He was given a four-year suspended prison sentence, which effectively amounts to probation. He admitted that he operated the so-called Willybot, which manipulated the price of Bitcoin upwards in 2013. The fact that he did this may suggest that he may have known something was going on before the House of Cards finally collapsed in 2014. Whether intentional or not, Mt. Gox was functioning in a Ponzi-like manner, as they were only able to honor customer withdrawals so long as there were net inflows coming into their hot wallet. As the single largest Bitcoin exchange, the failure of Mt. Gox set in shockwaves around the industry, and catalyzed the first crypto winter. But eventually, people figured out that the hack was a result of problems at Mt. Gox, and the price gradually recovered. In July of 2021, the Japanese bankruptcy court finally came up with a plan to distribute the funds to customers. For each Bitcoin a customer had deposited, they'll receive approximately 0.23. On the day Mt. Gox halted withdrawals, the price of Bitcoin was about $500. As of the time of recording this video, the price has increased 40-fold to almost $20,000. So even considering the fact that they lost 77% of their coins, they still made a 9-fold return in US dollar terms. Of course, it would be better to get the full 40-fold return, but realistically, not many of the depositors from 2014 could have stomached all the volatility and held all of their Bitcoin over the course of 8 years. There are 23,000 depositors who will receive on average $145,000 each once the rehabilitation plan is executed, which will likely happen within a few months' time. Not a bad payout for the money they probably wrote off as gone for good back in 2014. Alright guys, that wraps it up for this video. What do you think about the Mt. Gox hack? In a perverse way, did the hacker actually benefit the victims by forcing them to hold their Bitcoin for 8 years? Let us know in the comments section below. As always, thank you so much for watching and we'll see you in the next one. Wall Street Millennial, signing out.